Well, hey everybody, I'm uh, here for just a few minutes to talk to you about one of the most important theorems in calculus, which is Taylor's Theorem. And uh, for my real analysis students, of course, uh, I want you to appreciate the proof of the theorem. And uh, I'm not going to present this during the formal class. Uh, I would rather save the fun stuff for class, uh, which means uh, doing the applications of it and seeing how it's used. Um, but, uh, you know, the proof is important, and uh, I would like to have you uh, just watch this short video uh, to help you appreciate how it works, and uh, then we'll, we'll have fun with the applications a little bit, a little bit later on. Uh, just to rem remind you here, I mean, it takes a while just to write down the statement of this uh, very long theorem. We're talking about a function, a calculus function, right? And uh, we take some natural number n, and we assume that all of the derivatives of the function up through the nth derivative are continuous functions um, on the entire domain. Okay? And that if we take the n plus first derivative of f, that that at least exists on the open interval a, b. Right. So then if we take two points here, so we have an x naught and an x, and they're two points in the interval and they're not the same point, then there will exist a c in between the two points x and x naught, such that, and here's the long formula, basically you're writing f of x as, you'll recognize this part here, this is the Taylor polynomial, pn of x, right? Okay, and the fact that we can approximate f of x by a polynomial is nothing that bizarre, and we won't, don't really need Taylor's theorem. This is not the point of Taylor's theorem, right? What is the point is that when we approximate f of x by this Taylor polynomial, we would like to be able to manage or understand what the error is in doing that. So that is what this remainder term, that's the rn of x over here, that is what the remainder term measures for us. It is going to tell us what the error is. So for example, if we use a very large n, which means that you're using a Taylor polynomial of very large degree, so that it, that polynomial agrees with f, its derivative agrees with f, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the nth derivative, the, the first n derivatives of this Taylor polynomial agree with the first n derivatives of f at x naught. So if n is very large and you have a lot of agreement there, well, then you notice in the remainder term, which measures the error, notice that the n is in the denominator. It means that you're going to have a smaller error, right, because the denominator is going to be larger. Uh, another thing to notice, if x and x naught are very close together, right, in other words, you're evaluating, you're approximating f of x at a point that is close to x naught, well, uh, then this numerator will be very small. x and x naught are very close together, so uh, again, the error would be, would be smaller. So it kind of makes sense. This is a fraction. This remainder is a fraction, and you want to think about the numerator and the denominator in order to make a fraction smaller. The top needs to be smaller, or the bottom needs to be bigger. So you either have to take a large n, or you have to have x and x naught very close together, or both. Okay? So that's some intuition behind the, the equation here. What I want to do now is actually write down the proof. Okay, it's a very nice proof. We're going to use Rolle's theorem, which uh, is sort of a precursor to Taylor's theorem, uh, to do this. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to let x not be equal to x naught in the closed interval a, b. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a new parameter. I'm going to call it m. And m is going to be defined as follows. We're going to take f of x minus pn of x, okay? And we're going to divide that by x minus x naught to the n plus 1 power. For the time being, x and x naught are both assumed to be fixed, okay? So this is a fixed value, right? And what you'll notice here, though, is that what we really want to show <laughs> we can rephrase what we're trying to show, because we're trying to basically show that f of x minus pn of x is equal to this, right? Well, that's actually up in the numerator here. So what we really want to show is that m is equal to n plus 1 derivatives of f at x, uh, sorry, at c, and divided by n plus 1 factorial. If we can show that m is equal to that, 
that's equivalent to showing that this is the that this is the remainder term and therefore that this entire boxed formula is is correct okay so um, we of course have to find out what the C is that has not shown up yet in this proof so we're going to get there okay so to do this I'm going to define a new function G a G is going to map again from the closed interval AB to R and the way we're going to define it is I'm going to define G of T right as follows I'm going to take f of t minus pn of t. Okay, so we're going to subtract those two functions again. And then minus m times t minus x naught to the n plus 1 power. Okay, that's basically what we're going to do. Notice, uh, if I want to get n plus 1 derivatives of f involved, that's part of what we are looking at here and what we're trying to prove then I'm just going to think about, well, it would make sense that I might want to look at n plus 1 derivatives of g. Well, that's just n plus 1 derivatives of f minus, now, of course, if you differentiate a polynomial of degree n, n plus 1 times, it's going to get killed, right? It's going to be 0. And over here, my m is a constant. And as I take these derivatives exactly n plus 1 times, this is going to pull down these exponents, right? The n plus 1 comes down, then the n comes down, then the n minus 1 comes down, right? At the end of doing n plus 1 derivatives, you're left with a constant. And this is the constant that will be, that will be out in front. The m comes along for the ride the whole way, and these powers just keep coming down in front every time we, we move forward. Okay, so this is a nice formula, and what we can see is that if we figure out somehow what the point C is, right, we'll be able to put it in for T here, uh, right here and right here, and if somehow G of C with n plus 1 derivatives is equal to 0, so look at this, if I take n plus 1 derivatives of G and I evaluate it at C and I get 0, that's going to be exactly, that's going to exactly give us that value for m over there. So that's actually where we're going to be going with this proof. Okay, before we can get there, we need to look at some smaller derivatives of g. Okay, we need to look at some smaller derivatives. So, in particular, if we look at any k less than or equal to n, okay, if we look at k derivatives of g, and I'm going to evaluate this at x naught, Okay, and you'll see why in just a moment. Well, this would be k derivatives of f at x naught minus k derivatives of my Taylor polynomial of degree n at x naught. And if I'm only taking less than n plus 1 derivatives of this last term, you will have a factor of t minus m, sorry, t minus x naught that survives. And when you evaluate that at x naught, it's going to become 0. Right, so this last part, if I'm only taking less than n plus 1 derivatives and I evaluate it at x naught, you see that t, when you plug in x naught for t, that t minus x naught is going to be 0. Right? Okay. Now, but you guys remember that when we, when we compare our function at x naught to a certain number of derivatives and we compare our Taylor polynomial at x naught with a certain number of derivatives, these are supposed to agree, right? <laughs> That's how the Taylor polynomial works. It agrees with f up to n derivatives, and that's at the point x naught. So in other words, this is 0. We actually do know that. For every derivative of g up to the kth derivative, we know that that is, is equal to, to 0. Okay? On the other hand, if we, if we look at g of x, just, let's just start with g of x. Here's g of t right here. If we plug in x, we get f of x minus pn of x minus m times x minus x naught to the n plus 1 power, right? If you look back at how we defined what m is, right, and if you were to plug that in, if you plug in this m right into here, you see that that equals 0. <laughs> That equals 0. Okay, so look, g of x is equal to 0, and g of x naught is equal to 0. Isn't that something? So here's x and here's x naught, two distinct points. When you evaluate g, 
when you evaluate your function g, whatever it is, right? When you plug in x and x naught, you get zero. So look what happens. This should remind you of Rolle's theorem, right? According to Rolle's theorem, there will exist some point in between x and x naught where the derivative of g is zero. So let me, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and erase the, the statement of Taylor's theorem. I know it's a long one to remember. You can always rewind me if you need to and check this out in more detail, okay? But what I'm going to say is we're going to apply Rolle's theorem, apply Rolle's on the interval. It's either x to x naught or it might be x naught to x, right? It depends on which one is larger. But there's a definite in interval there. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're then going to apply Rolle's theorem and we're going to find a C1 in this interval. A C1 in this interval with g prime of C1 equal to 0. Okay. Ah, well now we have an interval. And by the way, it's in the open interval between x and x naught. Now we have two distinct points, C1 and x naught, and g prime is equal to 0 at both of those endpoints, right? So we're going to apply Rolle's theorem again, not to g this time, but to g prime. Okay, so apply Rolle's again to g prime on either the interval c1 to x0 or it could be x0 to c1 depending on which one is bigger. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're then going to find a c2. c2 is either in the open interval c1 to x0 or the open interval x0 to c1 with g double prime of c2 equals 0, right? And then you can just keep doing that, okay? Now you've got a point c2 where the second derivative of g is 0. We already know that the second derivative of g at x0 is 0. So we make another interval and we find another point c3, right? Okay, so continuing this process, continuing this process, we find we find a C3, a C4, a C5, and so on, all the way up through Cn, right? All the way up through Cn. And imagine we have our Cn in our hands, and we know that n derivatives of g at Cn is equal to 0. Okay? Now we can finally go one more time, and we can find the value of C. So now we're going to find C in... Uh, well, it's either going to be the interval from Cn to x0 or the interval from x0 to Cn, okay, with n plus 1 derivatives of g at c equal to 0. Isn't that what we said we wanted to, to come up with? Right? Here's our general expression for n plus 1 derivatives of g. And now we're saying we have found a point c, and I claim this is the point we want. We have found a point C oops, where that is 0. So now let's just plug that in, right? So we have here 0. Okay, so 0 is equal to n plus 1 derivatives of g at C. So that's n plus 1 derivatives of f at C minus m times n plus 1 factorial. So that's equal to 0. I said that already. Okay, if you now just rearrange that equation, solve it for m, you see that we've finished the proof, okay? So there's a lot of tricky steps here. You have to define this function g correctly based on this m that we started with here. And then you have to apply Rolle's theorem sort of repeatedly, starting with g, then g prime, then g double prime. All of these derivatives uh, exist. They're all continuous. We can apply Rolle's theorem over and over and over again until we finally get to this point here, okay? Um, wouldn't expect somebody to just dream up this proof uh, off the top of their head. It's not, not necessarily intuitive where it comes from in the first place. But uh, I hope that it all makes sense once you see the steps outlined. Uh, you see why we wanted to prove Rolle's theorem before we got to Taylor's theorem. Uh, what, an, what an important theorem, what a valuable theorem, and I definitely didn't want to overlook the proof. So um, study it up. Let me know if you have any questions about uh, anything that I uh, went over here.
and uh, we're going to do applications of it as well at another time, and I'm looking forward to that as well. All right, that's it. Thanks a lot, guys.